getting that first data science job is harder than they say, which sucks because when we start out, we're bombarded by statistics of how there aren't enough data scientists to fill the job postings and how companies are willing to throw on high salaries to fill these postings. Why then is it so difficult for you to land your first role? I'm in the best position to answer that because of three reasons. I landed my first data science role within the last couple of years. As somebody who graduated in data science, I'm connected with hundreds of other grads who have taken as little as a week or as much as over a year to land their first role. And now I even help interview potential data scientists who apply to the company where I work. So I have a rough idea of what helps you to stand out. And given this experience, I've developed a four pronged framework that will help you get that first role much more easily. But to effectively implement this framework, we need to understand why it's so difficult at the moment. Supply and demand dynamics will always play a role. And over the last decade, companies have realized that they can use data to either run more efficiently or just make more money in general. So they've been much more keen to fill these data science roles. But a decade ago, data science degrees were not a thing. So these roles were mainly filled by people who studied maths, physics, computer science, and those sort of things. But as the demand for data scientists continued to grow, the academic world adapted, and they began to offer dedicated data science degree programs, or even conversion masters like the one that I pursued. What that has meant is that every year, thousands of data scientists are shipped into the job market as they look to even that supply and demand dynamic. On top of that, during the pandemic, a lot of big tech companies overhired for data scientists. So now data scientists have been being laid off in thousands of numbers. And what that also means is the market is flooded with a lot of people who have a fan company on their resume, making things that much tougher. But, 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 it is still more than possible to get a data science job. And demand is still growing, and I still heavily recommend that you become a data scientist. But let's discuss this framework so that you have an advantage over everybody else. The first prong is the Tinder theory. Let's relate this to real life. Trying to get a job is weirdly like trying to get an online date. Imagine on a rainy Sunday morning, you decide to install Tinder, and you chuck a couple of pictures on your profile and decide, yes, I'm ready to meet that somebody special. You see some somebody you like and you decide to swipe right for the first time and no match. Aww. See, you can't get overly attached to the result of one swipe or one application. And this is what so many people I talk to in the real world do. They put in a few applications, they don't hear back and then they get discouraged. And that's because they're not leveraging the numbers game. You have to put in tens or even hundreds of applications. Going back to our example, the advantage of putting in so many applications is that now you can use each one of them as a data point. If you swipe right a hundred times or put in a hundred applications and you hear nothing back, that means the problem is that you need to improve your pitch. You either need to improve your profile or <laughs> in our case, improve your CV. And now because you have those data points, you can go away and improve that CV. Look, I can't tell you how to improve your Tinder profile, but I do have this video that will explain to you how I improve my CV to get my first role. And you can watch that at the end of this video. The last thing from the Tinder theory is that you can't get personally attached. If you put in an application and you hear nothing back, you can't get emotionally attached and start thinking it's because you are inadequate. Unfortunately, Unfortunately, because so many people are applying for the role, at times your CV isn't even seen by the hiring manager. Or maybe there's another candidate who is just the perfect fit for that role and is better qualified than you are. You can't control those factors, but what you can control is increasing the quantity of your applications as well as the quality of your applications. So every day you need to be looking to improve those two factors. The second prong is this, your weaknesses are actually your strength. As people from non-tech backgrounds, we tend to think that not having done an undergrad in something technical or mathsy is this insurmountable weakness to be overcome. But that's wrong. It's actually your biggest strength if you know how to use it strategically. Here's how. Imagine there are three data scientists in a room, one with an undergrad and a master's, both in data science, me, who did an undergrad in sports science and a master's in data science, and one who did, let's say, economics, undergrad, and master's in data science. If a big bank was looking to bring in a data scientist, assuming they're all competent data scientists, who would look most appealing to them? 
Obviously the economics guy, this is because he already understands the problems that can be solved in this domain by data science. He understands the language and not everything will have to be explained to him. And this has actually started happening to me. I've had sports science companies reach out to me and allow me to bypass that stage of submitting my CV and instead going straight to the interview because I have that background in sports science and they're looking for a data scientist. Essentially, leaning into your non-technical background can be an unfair advantage that other people just can't overcome. If you don't have a specific reason to choose one domain or another, choose the one that you did your undergrad or you have your background in, as that will allow you to stand out from the other applicants. We're no longer spraying and praying, we're now being tactical with our applications. The third prong is this, broaden your horizons. Getting that first job is a game changer in your career. From an employee's perspective, the difference between a data scientist with one to two years of experience, regardless of domain, and the one who is fresh out of university is massive. And that is why you should do everything in your power to get that first job. And actually, whilst we're on this, let's talk about Fang. Most data scientists have the dream of working for a Fang company. I mean, you get the name recognition, you get a nice cushy paycheck, and it just feels good. But becoming a Fang data scientist is competitive, really competitive. And within an hour of posting the job, you'll have hundreds of people who've put in their CV, and that's before even looking at the high requirements for that job. On a side note, I actually once saw a Fang company advertise for an internship position, and one of their requirements was a PhD in like like physics, <laughs> which was hilarious. But essentially, for your first job, if your applications to these fan companies are not going well, don't be afraid to broaden your horizons. There's a lot of startups, medium-sized companies, or even boring big companies who will give you good experience and a decent paycheck. Startups in particular will probably expand your skill set the quickest, which has actually happened to me because every day I have to do a little bit of data engineering, a bit of data analysis, in addition to my regular data science work. And startups actually offer you more opportunity to upscale your position quickly so then you can use that to leverage a position into a fan company down the line. So broaden your horizons so that whatever you do you get that first job out of the way. Now the final prong. It's not enough to be good at something People need to know that you're good. This actually goes for any field. Imagine if I was legitimately the best singer in the world, but I only sang in my room when I was alone. I would have zero shot at ever becoming a singer, but if I went into Walmart and yodeled, well... You never know what could happen. The same goes with going to university or a boot camp and getting all these technical skills and just sitting on them and hoping that some employer eventually notices you. That will not happen. You have to showcase your skills. And the most effective ways that I thought of to do this are having a portfolio that you can link on your CV application or on LinkedIn, posting content about your projects to a blog like Medium, on LinkedIn, on Twitter, YouTube, or wherever, to be honest, and networking, literally talking to people and just telling them what you do and that you are a data scientist. A case in point, I actually went to a friend's party a few weeks ago and I was talking to somebody else and one of his friends overheard the fact that I'm a data scientist and we got to talking and he told me that his company, this massive company, was actually looking for a data scientist. So does that mean I'd get the job automatically? No, but what he could do is make sure that my CV was at least seen by the hiring manager. So essentially this job that thousands of people had applied for, just by talking to people, I made sure that my CV was at least seen, purely through talking to a guy. Now imagine how this effect is multiplied when you consciously go to networking events time after time and you just keep expanding your network. Your notoriety around people will increase and this will give you a sneaky boost when you are applying for jobs. In the comments, I want to know where you are in your data journey and if you are curious about how to get into Fang as a data scientist, I interviewed an Uber data scientist and an Amazon data analyst and they gave me the inside scoop on how you can become just that. It's linked on the card right here and also subscribe to my newsletter to get tips on how to become a more effective data scientist.